because you don't want to follow the crowd because the crowd is the matrix. <laughs> so being because the universe always sends someone who find it hard sometimes just to be alone. I'm here to remind you. Remind yourself. You don't want to follow the crowd because the crowd is the matrix. <laughs> so being hot, it's a choice to say, actually, I don't want to follow the crowd. It's better to be alone than follow the crowd. Go. So because of this, a lot of the times, people who are highly awake often spend a lot of time alone. And that's a blessing. You see, I'm here to remind you that actually we are never alone because the universe always sends someone. But for those who find it hard sometimes just to be alone, I'm here to remind you. Remind yourself. You don't want to follow the crowd because the crowd is the matrix. <laughs> so being highly awake, you got a choice to make to go with a crowd going in the wrong direction or to stand in your truth. And sometimes you might find yourself standing alone with a cat down the road. Well, we can do that. We can do that deep divers. Okay. <laughs> the dark side of being highly awake. I spoke of the dark night of the soul, you also have to confront your shadow. You see, most people in this society have not done the shadow work. And when you are highly awake, you have to see things about yourself. You have to be honest, say, actually, I have a lot of unresolved issues. I've got a whole lot of work to do. We've got a whole lot to talk about. And therefore, you are faced with this reality that you aren't only good, you're bad and darn right ugly. You see, authenticity includes both positive and negative. And you realize that actually I'm the positive, but also I'm the negative. And a lot of people right now being highly awake, because a lot of people I meet are very awake. The dark side, though, comes when Sometimes people say you're a conspiracy theorist because you're saying every single day, we ain't having it. They call you a conspiracy theorist because you don't want to wear a face mask. They call you a conspiracy theorist because you don't want to be in lockdown. They call you a conspiracy theorist because you don't want a vaccine passport. They call you a conspiracy theorist because you've got a mind of your own. They call you a conspiracy theorist because all you want to do is just... Woo! Breathe in that good yeah, ass yeah, problem, baby. baby. And I want to remind you, deep divers, conspiracy theorists, that term was created by the CIA to stop people waking up. And I'm here to remind you, you're not crazy, you're just waking up. You see, most people don't think for themselves. They are only living a life that their parents want them to live, that society wants them to live. They're not free. They are living according to traditions, to traditions and cultures which actually enslave them. And a lot of people who are highly awake, they want to be free. They're free spirits. Their soul is free. And because of this, because of this, sometimes they get in trouble because they forget that they're living in this 3D matrix and there are rigid rules. But as you are awakening, you realize the only Laws are divine laws, divine order. Man-made laws aren't real. Look, they can change the time at any time. One hour backward, one hour forward. Therefore, it's an illusion. <laughs> time, man-made time, is an illusion. Shout out to everyone right now who is standing in their truth. When we talk of the dark side of being highly awake. We have to also talk about being the odd one out. 
Now, I actually see this as a blessing in disguise. Like, I was always the odd one out. I'm left-handed, by the way, deep divers. Do you know my grandma? She was born in Sierra Leone. And if you were left-handed, they used to beat you because they thought you were like a chosen one, that you had special powers. Because everyone used to write with their right hand. Only a few people would write with their left hand. You see, as someone who is highly awake, you are sometimes singled out because you are unique. You are sometimes singled out because sometimes you are the odd one out. Everyone in your classroom is just <laughs> listening to the teacher press rewind back at school. You are looking out of the window because you're like, actually, I should be out there, not in here, getting programmed. <laughs> the dark side of being highly awake is actually when you realize seven day vegan challenge, you're all around the table and they say, Hey, stop being fussy. Seven day vegan challenge. Okay. What you don't eat butter. What you don't eat eggs. What you don't eat meat. And sometimes it was hard for me. I've been plant-based. I've been a vegan for over 15 years. Okay. I wake up every single day with a whole bunch of grapes in my mouth. And I remember deep divers the first time when I went plant-based, I was at a wedding. And I had people, even I know, family, certain family members, they're like, gosh, Ralph, you're losing weight. Gosh, that's a terrible thing to do. Don't you know you need to eat meat? You need to eat eggs? You need to eat processed foods? I'm like, no, I don't. I can just eat leafy greens and vegetables and I'm good to go. So you are often seen as fussy because you actually care about your health. Go figure. Oh, you're the person who loves cold pressed juice. That's because cold pressed juice, cold pressed juice actually preserves the enzymes which actually help you digest food. Okay, so continue being a fussy plant based eater, deep divers. I'm rooting for you. Okay, the dark side of being highly awake. Let me talk to you. Now, this happens to me all the time. People are like, Ralph, gosh. I can't believe you said that. You are supposed to be spiritual. I told you. <laughs> Spirituality means accepting the good, bad, and ugly about yourself, okay? So you are often sometimes seen as holier than thou, the Dalai Lama, okay? Because people think, oh, because you're highly awake, you must be meditating every single day and burning sage and being a perfect, righteous being. And they forget that, hey, you're still human. Like I am a multidimensional being having a human experience at the same time. I'll still put your ass in your place, okay? <laughs> I can't believe you said that. Oh, I got more to say for you, okay? So a lot of people forget that just because you're highly awake, it doesn't mean that you're a softie. It means that you're also confident. It means you're also full of audacity. It means you can also speak up for yourself. And sometimes people might find you a bit hard. They might see, gosh, this person really can speak so much power. And I don't like that because spiritual people are just supposed to be passive and quiet and docile. No, <laughs> you got the wrong one. <laughs> The dark side of being highly awake, it's actually a blessing. But many times we put pressure on ourselves to reach unattainable goals of nirvana. And sometimes we give ourselves such a hard time in trying to meditate five hours a day and six hours a day and there's a lot of competition. Spirituality, once again, is when you accept who you are. You're not here to compete with Ralph Smart. I'm not here to compete with you. And you definitely aren't here to compete with the cat down the road, okay? So when we talk of us realizing we are enough, we don't have to try hard to be. We are already a magnificent creation. And this is why a lot of people who are highly awake, sometimes they got to learn how to give themselves a break. You're doing better than you think. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Like a proud dad, deep divers. <laughs> the dark side of being highly awake is that sometimes you forget many people are just blindly listening to what the media say. 
what the television says and they can't think for themselves. And sometimes because of this, you realize that so many people have been programmed. And because of this, you often get into arguments with people. Sometimes you get into disagreements because you're like, I just wish you would wake up, right? <laughs> Happens to me all the time, actually, not anymore, but it used to. Because I, I, now, I now realize everybody wakes up at a different time. And as a highly awake being, you have to understand that the truth can't be told, it has to be realized. Mm. <laughs> Slow motion this side. Mm. The dark side of being highly awake. Sometimes we can think we know so much, then life humbles us, okay? Enlightenment is knowing how much you don't know. So as a highly awake being, you realize, gosh, I thought I knew it. No, there's always more to learn. So you are faced with this reality that you don't know. Shit. You could have just read like 5,000 books, but that isn't the truth, right? Because the truth is something you can't read in a book. Oh, deep divers, right? So you realize you are just the same as everyone else. It's just that you are aware that there is more to life than meets the eye. So I want to remind you, deep divers, it is a blessing, a gift to be highly awake. At the same time, being highly awake means that you have to take a look at your shadow. You have to integrate your shadow into yourself. You also have to realize you didn't come here to be perfect. You came here to be real. Also, you have to realize everyone wakes up at a different time. Not everyone's going to make it. And a lot of us who are highly awake, we have to watch people close to us, family and friends, be programmed in the matrix and still keep a straight face. Okay, it's time to smile, deep dives. And then just say, feel so good to be alive, baby. Can I get a hello there? Beautiful deep divers. I love all of you. Let's just, woo, breathing in that good ass prana, baby. Such a beautiful day, deep divers. Shout out to everyone who's been getting the wonderful good ass prana shirts at ralphsmart.com slash clothes and spreadshirt.com if you're in America. And if you're a sexy ass model, woo, who's highly awake, you want to model the clothing? Well, let me know why you have what it takes to model the clothing, okay? Add me on Instagram for more daily inspiration at official Ralph Smart and Facebook at Ralph Smart. Check out the new book, Deep Divers, for more powerful information just like this. Feel Alive by Ralph Smart on Amazon and at ralphsmart.com slash the book. And of course, Snapchat, add me there at good ass prana, pardon, at good ass prana, baby. They tried to bury us. They forgot we were seeds. Deep divers, remind yourself, stay as free as you can because that's our birthright after all. Hey, I see a lot of people doing the breathing in that good ass prana challenge. Upload a video to YouTube if you haven't done it of you breathing in that good ass prana, baby. Put in the title, breathing in that good ass prana. Ralph Smart, Infinite Waters. I'm picking 10 people every single month giving them grand prizes, like having a conversation with me in nature. Deep divers, stay woke. I love all of you. One love, one love, one love. Peace. Infinite waters, diving deep once again. Stay well, stay healthy. Peace. You! Breathe in that good ass prone, baby. So good every time. Have a beautiful day, deep divers. Peace.
to, to, to let you know that this knowledge that is most assuredly African has been known. That this is no great discovery for the scholars of Europe, the metaphysical schools of the European, including the Jehovah's Witness, who put the, the, the Egyptian wings and sun on their literature in the early 1900s. So when you're reading Yakanon and Van Sertima, they're telling you that this knowledge came from your ancestors, they're correct. It's not a hoax, you're not trying to flatter you. It gets you. And our subconscious needs to know that. It's not about pride. I think I mentioned this before. Our pride is faith without knowledge. It's about knowing. Knowledge brings awareness of yourself. Awareness of self is what confidence is. And you need that to walk in the Western world successfully. Okay, I'm getting off my theme here. I feel like I'm on a soapbox. Uh, okay, we're, we're, we're going to start. Let me thank you for coming in the light of the great Super Bowl stuff. <laughs> if, if the brothers, I get on the bus. These old dudes that studied our history, like they have studied football, baseball, <laughs> and we know something. So look at all the stats. You know, we didn't come in for the Super Bowl. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> <bro. laughs> but there's so many black athletes that are in that particular sport. It makes sense that the collective ego lies to those athletes. Uh, Now it's all about the erratic egos of the athletes. Uh, I've done that myself once in my life when Cleveland State was playing Navy. And Cleveland needed a championship. And the referees cheated them out of it, they took it from them. I've never been that angry about the sport so since my own days of playing basketball. So I understand that, that level of ego. This is supposed to be about, it is about the 12 powers of man, but uh, as with Charles Fillmore being of the fraternal order of theology and metaphysics, our approach is from the black woman, who is the mother of Pseudicaius. Mother, English, that's mother, the primal substance of which all things are made, that's mother. According to CM Bay, the, the, the term Zubikaius is supposed to be an old ancient term. I can't prove that, nor can I disprove it, but I went to the, the, the library in Cleveland to, to verify. And what I found was the Latin word zodiacus, which is the, the Greco Latin word for zodiac. Very key. Okay. I, I know it's at least one brother in here or sister in here who has been calling him or herself uh, this particular name. Right? Is that Hebrew? <laughs> okay, did you, did you write this down? This is a Greek word. Dr. Yakanan gave the correct articulation of, of the word, and it is for black men of the Nile, and we the black Jews. Aribu is the old African word. Those were Africans that saw them coming into the land of Africa, out of the territory of, of, of Kush. Uh, it seems pretty standard that 
Yachman will, will give a, a, a clarity on the concept, but he doesn't give a definition of it. <laughs> okay, so um, you just have to assume that Haribu means those wanderers, those who crossed over. Wow, okay. <laughs> but this is what this word means. That's what it means. Now, how can I prove that? Take, take out a dollar, hold it on, have a dollar, pull it out. Look on the reverse side of the dollar. Now look at the, the design around the lettering and so forth. What do you see? All right. See it there? Okay. Now, now, the reason we know it's her in terms of her web is because this is her web. What, what I'm doing now is squaring the circle. That, that's one square. That's two squares. This knowledge that is most assured revelation, inner revelation, and the power of inspiration for the scholars. We have a point here. I just going to use my fingers. They're actually on the Jehovah's Witness who put the, the, the Egyptian wings and sun on their literature in the early so affirmation from my ancestors, kind of sense of rhythm we have inherited. Two, four, six, eight, instead of one, three, five, seven. The universe is two, four, six, eight. Oh shit! But it's very important to get to the law of rhythm. The power center at the throat. All right, the spoken words you open it up. Many, I almost said most, I don't know most. Many singers automatically open up their power center just because they sing and use that faculty with ear. That doesn't mean because they sing, it means that they're doing all positive thought of terribly unhappy people. Would be wonderful time. I don't think they should have been. If they had self knowledge. We're going to use some affirmations. I'm going to uh, let us out here early because I know some of you. Super Bowl football fans are right here in this room. So uh, I, I may provisionally get back to your TV before six. I think it starts at six or something like that. Uh, there is the corpus geminia in the brain that is not in this book, it's in the occult literature. <laughs> If you want to know how to create on the screen, on the screen of imagination. And this is important for us because we are imagined. The corpus geminia is called. It's a very small faculty. I think I got it up here. On the front of the brain. That's where you make the image that you want. We already do that. You see. Very interesting uh, thing. Is 
He goes home on his way home at these over this frightening experience of almost getting stung. He walks up the street and keeps seeing and starts kicking his face through his butt in his mind. He makes the pictures. He sets up the circumstances. He sets up the events all in his creative realm, in his creative world. He then is lord of the plane of mind. He sees himself winning. No longer afraid. There's no bully in this world. There's no master in this world. You do the same thing when you have something you want to sell. When you have a product that you want to spread, you eventually spread by creating the circumstances consciously. That then is your psychological assumption. You place it on the mental plane, seeing the events taking place on the mental plane, and you affirm it on the plane of power, the power of the spoken word, as you psychologically accept it as a reality. That's for anything in this universe you want, except. Some other human being. You can't have anybody you want. But any object, any idea is open for grace, provided it does not already belong to someone else. Following the nature of the law does not take the nature of the law of the universe only is. of God only give the nature of love. So the brother who said, I love you, baby. You love me. He's that boy. You're all responsible for loving. You're not responsible for finding out who loves you. Love only goes one way. There's no give and take in life. Only that's the universe, that's each nature. The power of mind, very important, very important. Okay, we're gonna. Okay, here, let me, let me, this is 33, so let me feel this. That's the Christ mind. This represents. This center here, the crown center. Here up is super fine. Everything up here is perfect. You need to develop anything up here. It's already up there. That's your heaven on the earth. That's the divine mind. All of the information on there is correct and perfect. Power. Miraculous power, magical power, healing power. When you imagine from up here, whatever you imagine from there happens instantly. That's a powerful the image making mechanism faculty of the mind is the instant healing of the master. Done with thought. Power, perfect imagination. That's part of your natural makeup. Sleeping in the boat. Go look it up. Begin with the heart center to get some clear perspective about love. Self-less give it instead of receiving first. But you go up to bed now. If you were going out there to call me, you don't have to bring me that money. You know, the problem is down in the black wall. If you say you love me, then we're going out there, bring me $300. Shut up. 
she would go out there and get it. I love love the work like that. But the dog go for the dog would get the place that she does. This case, this case is not mine. We were talking about the, the minister of the world is still here saying that the love of money is the root of all. Black folks out there say, Amen, Reverend, Amen. Well, that's incorrect, too. This is the problem. The lust of it is the problem. This has no faculty in your spiritual nature. That is the matter. Lust will guide your life. That's how you keep your mind. You gotta have this. But you don't want this. Adding your love. That's the problem. This makes for jealousy, not love. Love does only one thing it gives. This makes as much as it can get.
neuron transmitted switch on. Think about Big bio. Important, very important. Vitamins are very important, especially neuron transmitters. For the brain, for thinking, for imagining, for learning, and for remembering, for recall. There's nothing wrong with this human memory. It's the ability or inability, the faculty of recall. It's not functional. Much of the time. It responds to commands. I can't remember. How we are programming our brain. Love and wisdom are concerning us. Wisdom. It's about knowledge and the right answer. That's the male part of love. It's about the secrets of how the universe operates and functions. It's about the hidden knowledge that's in your own subconscious mind or the kinds of spiritual talents and abilities that came back to your lips. It's hidden from yourself. You can have released your meditation. Get to that point where you're willing to take this responsibility. Make it responsible. Meditation. We're going to chant all this stuff. The sound power of all, how it affects the entire five faculties in the brain, growth areas of this. How this universe operates. Why it's considered to be privileged knowledge. Now, that's what a mystery is. And so you are let in to that remote doors or secret doors. About the power of how things function. About the power of how to heal. I emphasize talent because I know from my history as well as from the science, we are talented. Probably the most talented people are. My son is very new to the world. I'm convinced of that. We're not all basketball players, thank God. <laughs> Other talents. The outline of affairs on that particular physical demonstration. I think that to let you know that this knowledge that is most assuredly African to know that this is a great discovery for the scholar of Europe, the metaphysical school, including such an almost witness. The Egyptian wings and suns on their minister in early So when you're reading Yamanon and Mansurva, they're telling you that this knowledge came from your ancestors, they're correct. That holds you, not trying to flatter you. It's you. Our subconscious needs to know that. It's not about pride. I mentioned this before. I'm trying to be faith without knowledge. Knowing. Knowledge brings awareness of yourself. Awareness of self is what confidence is. And you need that to walk in the Western world successfully. We'll get getting off of being here. Uh, like I'm on the sofa. Uh, okay, we're, we're, we're going to start on it. Thank you for coming. In the light of the great super bowl stand up. So, if, if the brothers, I get on the bus.
Sleep. <laughs> Reference to hidden knowledge, 
again, or great wisdom. Certain concepts have been kept out of the way of the uninitiate and kept as privileged knowledge for those uh, hidden orders. A part of that plot and plan is due to the responsibility of the ancient Moor from the first university on this planet, the Egyptian mystery school. There is, most assuredly, a body of knowledge that is privileged. That's what kids behind the concept of mystery. Privileged knowledge, keep out. That's the creator's work. So the Egyptian mystic system is based upon this idea of privileged knowledge. The whole statement that is given in the Bible about Jesus saying, uh, do not talk or cast your pearls among swine is a very so vulgar uh, depiction of the idea of the misuse, the possible misuse of real knowledge. By real knowledge, I mean the knowledge that contains power, that allows you the opportunity to change your life, your consciousness, your status on the earth. That's real knowledge. The rest of it could be easily classified simply as good information. And there's nothing wrong with good information. The laws that govern the universe are power knowledge. These seven principles tell you how the universe works from its mental plane, where we are directly involved in creation, in the mental realm where we live, move, and have our being. That's the God that Paul is referring to in his letter. The God that has always been here, can't go away, can't die, doesn't have to come back. It is his nature itself. Very important to know that in gaining a very important power. And I've been through this before, it jumped right back in my subconscious, as certain concepts have a tendency to do. Because here is where the African American needs to grow in terms of understanding what he and she is doing in church. Religion is based essentially upon this idea that I spell it right, probably not. And they are using this. Both the minister and the faithful are using these two words as if they are synonymous, and they are not. This word comes from the Latin word, Corbi, then the dictionary, then they are all this time. This is the definition given for the word Corbius. that every one of us needs more of. Belief is the willingness to accept what someone else says, does, or explains. The baby believes his or her mother, follows his or her mother wherever she goes. That's not faith. That's belief. Jesus makes the given or credit as giving a reference to the base, the idea of the believer. The Quran is filled with the idea of the believer. Yet in the more advanced stages of that same spirituality, the, the personality of Ali is brought forward. The note. Confidence. Our people believe in God. They will give all of the praise and glory to God. Uh, let me draw this example because it's such an ideal one. A woman came into the bookstore in Cleveland, Ohio. One evening was there. I had met her before somewhere and she started talking. She started talking about religion. And she got very excited, but she started 
kidney and tongue. And she just went off for about 10 or 15 minutes, you know. And I guess maybe it was spontaneous, I don't know. But anyway, after she finished speaking in tongues, we started talking. And she was telling me that she needed to uh, rent money. Like so I just <laughs> the Lord would provide so forth. I mean she had strong quote faith unquote. So I said, Well let me do your chart. So we sat down and I did a chart. And I gave her four numbers. Uh, and uh, I told her the possibility of these coming out in one to three days was almost a guarantee. That's how strong that's all about. And, I was and all of the numbers I gave her were in her name and birthday. So she was sitting, we, we were both sitting down. She was sitting there and she said, Well, I'll put these in when I go home and, and go downtown. I said, No, if you do that, you won't get a chance to put them in before 7 30. If you walk across the street there, you can put them in uh, right across the street in the supermarket. And just as I said that, her spirit tried to raise her up. You know, and her eyes got big. You know, I, I could see it was her spirit because the same thing had happened to me. She wouldn't get up. She sat there and she talked and she had $11. I remember that because she wanted to buy a book that cost $14.95. She didn't have And uh, we talked until 7.25. I turned the TV on. I started to put it on channel 5 at 7.30, 173 fell the fourth number out of this one. That would have given her for 50 cents. She'd had $291 to pay her rent, light bill, gas bill, and get drunk. <laughs> the reason I'm drawing this example is because our people are caught up here. They have all this belief in God, all this faith in God, and no faith in themselves. Knowledge enhances self-confidence. Knowledge enhances the power of faith. It helps you to open up the faculty of faith. There's a faculty in your brain designed for the spirit to work through so that you shall have not faith in God, but the faith of God. Mm. That's deep. Let me see if I got it up there. Well, I don't want to get distracted. Okay, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Very, very, very important word. In the 60s, we were talking about, I'm black and I'm proud. You know, and so they said the check just stuck out and the afro got big and bigger. You know, and it looked great. You know, it looked it strong. Deep. I'm still reflecting off of it. That's definitely deep. Yeah. We really did not have the confidence that we were trying to espouse. And we didn't have the knowledge. They had pride. And pride is faith without knowledge. That's directly from the Spirit. I haven't found it written anywhere. It is faith without knowledge. It's a feeling, but not an understanding. We need knowledge as power. The Kabbalion opens with an introduction about the Egyptian mystery school and the masters of Egypt. Nowhere in this book will you find the clarification that he's talking about Africa. Okay. They weren't doing that in 1912. <laughs> at least not the book that we're bringing forward so that the Western Hemisphere could find a, a new perspective about this lowly man and woman that they had used and abused for 400 years. Some of our scholars during that time, during the so-called Black Renaissance, had made that kind of identification. But the problem then is, is, is one that's being solved now, is the outlet of publication and distribution of literature and the interest of self-knowledge is higher now than ever before since we've been in the Western industry. So they weren't able to reach the mass. The, the good reverend was reaching the Negro mass, but he had less knowledge in his congregation, particularly about who he was. And there were a few who had that knowledge. The first law of nature 
is the law of self-preservation. I remember seeing and listening to old men standing on the corner talking that stuff. And of course, being young and ignorant, I thought they were brilliant. The first law of nature mother is self-preservation. Well, that's almost right, but not quite. The first law of nature is the law of vibration. Everything is in motion. Nothing stands still. Nothing is at rest. What this tells us immediately is that death is a myth. First thing it tells us. And it's important to understand the things that give us phobia. And death does as we get so called older and older. We begin to move into the idea, the collective idea of dying and death. And it disturbs our development. You can't place your sense of confidence in abundant life, everlasting life, ongoing life, if you're haunted by the idea of, de of, of, of dying. As the, the black men used to talk about, everybody wants to go to heaven, but don't nobody want to die. <laughs> well, the proposition of getting to heaven is not by death. Heaven is within you. It is understanding who you are, what you are, and where you are. Very, very, very important. That is the most key, the central theme of why a human being should study. To know who you are, what you are, and certainly where you are, in order to move forward. Consciously, evolution will drag all of us forward. But the idea, in terms of the proposition of master, is to be conscious of where you're going 24 7. The law of vibration is the law of motion, the invisible. In the beginning was God, in the beginning was the Word, all are concepts that deal with the vibration of motion. Here I go, this is the place of the chart again. This is the numerical for the law of vibration. This is the symbol of the law of vibration. I made it real big. <laughs> you wouldn't miss it. A musical note. The word note comes from the Latin word nota, which means to know. We talked last week about numero. That numero does not mean to count. That these are not numbers. Those are configurations or symbols. When you're talking about number or numero, you're talking about melody, harmony, and metric. Okay, I'll, I'll leave mathematics alone right now, because it gets me out there. So number one is a concept that you'll find in a very interesting place in the scriptures in John chapter 17. Father, I and thee, thou and I are one. I in thee, thou in me, we are one in unity. That, that, that's the Heavenly Father and the Son, the same being. Does not mean that Jesus did not have a father, because according to our ancient records, he most certainly did have a father. His father's name is in the book. Christians, Jews, and Muslims articulate his name every time they pray. They don't know it's the Heavenly Father's name or a Heavenly Father's name. Mussolini get mad at me. One is on the back of the dollar bill. In God we trust one. Big design for the idea of one. 
George Washington was the father of this nation. He was the high potentate of the Masonic Order. That's the one they trust. In their concept of G-O-D, generator, operator, destroyer, is an esoteric meaning. The Masonic meaning of G-O-D is government of democracy. They had the design for that. I don't keep getting away here from where I'm going, but I'll get back to the law of vibration. From the center of here, five pointed star, which is on your American flag. Very dark on your American flag. Washington, D.C. Yeah. In an astrological. Yeah, I heard and that. Moorish, mathematical, and esoteric design. Brilliant black man. Brilliant. Benjamin Baxter. The first bad. black scientist in America is what he's been entitled as B A N N E K A R. Baxter. Dash B E Y. They will get to the Bay Eel and Ali later on as we talk more about more stuff. But what I want you to keep in mind, we're talking about all of this information. Is the science, is the spirituality that you are supposed to inherit? It got disrupted and interrupted and curved through slavery, which is not our history. Those are current events, and that's all. Don't buy into that at this point. That's, that's not a part of your winning psychology. The records of the past are designed and recorded to tell those in the future how the ones in the past succeeded so that they might also succeed. That's the spiritual and psychological value of this. Find out how to win, to achieve, to accomplish. To endure is fine, but we have over endured. We've been holding on what? over 400 years and if you're holding on to something how, how, how can you go forward we got to quit holding on we're not down here to survive we're down here for one primal reason be ye perfect even as thy heavenly father is perfect now that's attributed to the teachings of Jesus and if it's not a part of your nature to be perfect, no man could ask you to be perfect. So the axiom tells you there's something in you that is already complete. What is the problem then? Well, this is, I mentioned that last Sunday. Nobody called me on that. Uh, call me on this stuff. I'll leave something out. Raise your hand. Say something. You know? Very important because vibration is the foundation of what we are and where we are. It is the essence. Of whatever we see, smell, touch, and taste. And for us, it heightens in importance when we understand that vibration is the underlying aspect of what music is. It's rhythm. Rhythm is very important for us. We are caught up in our music, and I do mean caught up. <laughs> What we need to understand is when you talk about music, you're talking about the law of the universe, and you're talking about energy, so you're talking about power, and power changes things. In understanding rhythm, look at it this way, we're talking velocity very key. We're going to deal with velocity and rhythm in our meditation today. The difference between these two ones is the difference between us and Jesus. We are vibrating here at a certain rate of speed. Christ Jesus, the Creator, the High Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Most High, is vibrating up here at another rate of speed. 
Our prayers, one uh, yogi said, uh, most folks' prayers don't even hit the ceiling, let alone go to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true because, believe it or not, most Christians are not taught how to pray. They're told how to pray. They're not understanding that the power they want to reach is in their own kingdom, is in their own forehead, is in their own spiritual pole, that as they grow and develop is moving up their vertebrae into their astral body, that everything you need is within you to get to heaven, to improve your life, to master your life, to heal your body. It's all within, where the kingdom of heaven is within. The reason there's no immediate response for most prayers, I should do this best by demonstrating this, that the two are vibrating like this. What we're trying to do in our spirituality is vibrate on a higher plane. That we get to where the divine rhythm, the divine vibration is vibrating. And we are vibrating at or near that level of the rate of speed. That's what you're doing when you meditate. Every time you bring your third, your attention to your third eye, your energy goes up. Every time you look at your feet, your energy goes down. If you're sleeping face down, your energy is going through the bed, through the floor, right to hell. <laughs> okay, literally, it's going out of your body. Just sleep on your, if you can, sleep on your back so that your energy moves up and go to sleep at the point of your third eye. So your energy is moving up. You're going to tell me what will happen. We don't need to do that much to get God to help us. But we need to do something to let the higher self know that the lower self is tired of this mess down here. Okay. And things happen spontaneously. One of the most wonderful things about the spiritual path is the spontaneity of the spirit. It's remarkable. It, it, it's nothing boring about the creator. So we're talking about the variations of energy. We're talking about an energy that moves in a rhythmic path harmoniously. We're talking about riding the wave of spirit in our lives, in our walking, in our going to and fro. That's the law of vibration. The law of energy. The key word here is sound. Sound is a part of motion. It is produced by motion. Light is produced by motion. Rhythm is produced by motion. Then what produces motion? An invisible thing. Divine will. The cause of existence is the will of creating. The impulse to manifest is the metaphysical rationale of why we exist, as well as how we exist. Divine will. Very important, because if you're going to do the will of God, you must have the will of God. You have a faculty in your brain for divine will. The thy shall not period is not doing the will of God. That's abstaining. That's staying out of trouble. That's not it. <laughs> the difference between, I like to point this out, the difference between Christ and a Christian. That a Christian goes to church to get an answer through a prayer. He goes to church to get a healing. He goes to church to learn something. He goes to church to pray for a miracle. Or Christ goes to church to teach, to work miracles, to answer prayers, and to heal. That's what black folks are supposed to be doing. If they are under the knowledgeable awareness that they are supposed to be becoming Christ-like, there's nothing in the Bible 
what Jesus says, become a good Christian. Oh, I 
God, you hear that one? <laughs> then you'll be like God. Well, in the dramatization of that idea of being tempted to partake of the forbidden fruit, it's the pull of evolution. Glad I got back to that. It's the pull of evolution of the perfect man, the perfect being, into the creation. Evolution, write these down. Revolution. Evolution. And evolution. Whatever is involved, as in a cake or pie or any recipe, to make it very simplistic, must necessarily revolve. This is key in understanding power. Revolve. That's the old English word. Or turn. Okay. What nature does. Turn. At a 45 degree angle. No less. But turn. That's evolution. And it's in action. And the revolving of a thing an object or an idea, how it manifests and how it develops. Uh, again, understanding the significance of vibration. You want higher energy. You want an energy so high that the lesser particles of the creation can no longer influence that body. In other words, so that you can't get sick. That no dis ease can enter into your nature, into your psyche. Thanks. That no idea of death, sickness, disease, fear, poverty, hunger, the things that haunt the ordinary man can't get into the mind of God. Cannot get in to the Christ like one. Cannot get in to the master, able, and noble. That's the law of vibration. In that duality, oh, before I do that, look at this. I need comments on this first. Devolution. If you look at this concept here, you see something very interesting. <laughs> All law is embodied. If the light is embodied, the darkness is embodied. If the law of love is embodied, the law of fear is embodied. The opposite of love is not hate, it's love. Evolution, involution, evo a revolution, and devolution is embodied as someone who has charge of that realm and that power. This is the force that brings you down, I mean, in other words, in the evolution or pull up. One is pulled down. We, we don't literally fall. It is energy that goes up to its peak, and then it descends like a roller coaster to gain more momentum. The coming off of the high point of your cycle, of your life, 
is so that you can gain more momentum. As an intelligent being, you're supposed to also gain the insight for the next upswing of your cycle. What happens? The problem is we get caught up in the cause of the life of knowledge, in the despondency of our illusions. Three major illusions. Complex. Guilt. Inferiority. Persecution. I think there's a three major complex that we riddle the African and American. So we hold on to the dip. We stay down here. That's where the brothers you see walking around like this. That's where they are. They can't see up there, but they ain't looking for them. No vision. No knowledge of self. So the habit is better than nothing. At least you've got a companion. Devolution takes you down. Every great cycle has a point where it devolves as it is about the process of both revolving and evolving. Every human being, every soul is going through this cycle until they reach the vibration that corresponds with this kind of energy. Then they're no longer involved in this if they have mastered this energy. They're not pulled by the cosmic forces that move herd consciousness that keep things in its quote natural playful state. They become lords of the earth. The lords of mind. They become spiritual kings and queens. This is an ongoing process, not forever and forever, according to the yogic masters. There's even a point where the creation closes and everything is drawn back into the place or source or all from whence it came. That's a long, long way from now, so we don't have to worry about that. If you look at this, you see backwards here, L-O-V, love. Is involved. You look at revolution, you see the lover is involved. You look here, you see love is involved. The past tense of love. Again, here you see love is involved. Very, very key for us to understand this universe has the underlying principle of the law of attraction that is drawing you back towards the center in the long overall hall of evolution. So when you drop this body, you just finish up, you, you, you'll have to come get another one, come back to some other woman's womb and be her child four times until you, man, know thyself, to thine own self be true. That's the Bodhavista of the Hindi Kushite religion, the everlasting mercy of God. It keeps giving you the opportunity to evolve and grow. That's the nature of nature. Literally, there is no death. Then what's the problem? Losing consciousness is what death is. Mm. Losing consciousness. We die daily, Paul said. Message. But he didn't say we're dead day, daily. The art of dying is what spirituality is. It certainly is a difference. In that process where you are relinquishing your lesser consciousness, your body, brain, mind, to your divine mind, you're being moved to a higher plane of existence. Uh, the yogi, the Sufi and other teachers of spirituality state that most people at night, when they go to sleep, they go somewhere. And I didn't believe that until I got to Philadelphia and the Ansaru Allah community. And I went into the uh, reading room or the lodge, the uh, lobby, and I sat on the floor and was reading a book titled Man, uh, God's Wonderful Creation. 
I was trying to read the book and I fell off sleep. When I woke up, just as I woke up, I saw myself coming down from somewhere, coming back into the body, and this brother was standing up on a cloud like this with his hands behind me. And that day I talked about five or six different people, and I had all of the answers for every question that they had. So I'm convinced now that, that we do go somewhere and study because we came from somewhere. And we need to become conscious of that. That you are learning. Making mistakes cannot be learning. If that is the process, then make all the mistakes you can. That means you'll know more. I think that's a point of miseducation that leaves us victim to intuitive insight. The point of spiritual principle is that you're already perfect, that the nature of the soul is that of knowledge. What you're trying and we're trying to do is to realize what we need to know. That's where these come in, when they are open, when your spiritual faculties are functioning. That's when the knowledge that you're seeking can easily come through. Those are the days and nights that you have these intuitive flashes and you wonder, how did I know that? That's what spiritual development is all about. Just getting your 12 apostles prepared to go out into all the nations. That's well, the entire body. Always you have to go. In duality, I think everybody has pretty much tuned into duality. I got a short here somewhere. Cold and hot, tall and short, soft and hard. Dr. Yakanon did a piece on that. It's the concept of duality the left and the right of things, the up and the down of things is where we are, the good and the bad. The good and the evil. There's a hieroglyphic of Horus and Set. And of course, Horus is the, the good one, Set is the evil one. But the two heads are on the same body. Very interesting. They were considered to be twins or brothers. Oh, just a second. I, I got a fog here trying to get to the board here. The word twin comes from the twa, the little one, our ancestors. Those are the great buildings in our world. The principle itself is lodged in nature. Twa, twin, twain, two, look alike. The reason we're able to function on this dimension is because of duality. Jesus did not tell Satan in this allegory to go away. He said, get thee behind me, or is this thing? The law of the light is correspondent with the law of the dark. In terms of duality, duality That would be the negative. Let's say that's upside down. The point I'm making is that on the pole of polarity, whatever is prompted as the first or the positive produces a second as its negative. It is the same thing. Heat and cold or hot and cold in water. The importance of understanding that is how you change your consciousness in terms of duality. That you can go from sad to joy 
that you will make it so. You've got to deal with that part of the metaphysical process of thinking. To change your entire mood with your mind is a part of self mastery. Some problems we can solve, many problems only have to be dissolved like hard sugar. Some problems have no action. Just dissolve it. Getting your consciousness up to a higher plane. Duality is very important because it didn't exist. We couldn't move. It isn't going anywhere. The, 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 the struggle between the sons of light and the sons of darkness is an eternal struggle. That the concept of being perfect, looking at this line here, that's good. That, that, that is not being perfect. This is being perfect. It is above both good and evil. It is above duality. It is above the law of duality, the law that Paul makes reference to this letter. This is the law of pure mind. Correct. The law of absolute, where there is no opposite at this point. That's where we're trying to get to. And it's possible. I think we need to know we're not talking about more eons of evolution. You're supposed to reach a, a level of perfection in this life. In Job chapter 1. Verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. He was perfect and upright. And, and even Job, as being perfect, could get through. So we're talking again degree. We're talking dimension. We're talking about the unfolding mystery of yourself. Lord, before Lord was. M A N, Master Abel and Noble, then Lord, then the Son of God, and then God, and then Almighty God. That's the evolutionary path. Understanding at those particular points of development, you are supposed to accomplish something in your world. You have those powers and talents to do so. Many good people. Great souls, they did the work of the Lord. They did church work. And they left no legacy. They wrote no books. They taught no courses, no classes. Some even did some healing. But they went on to their glory. And, and here we are, stuck down here, still trying to figure out who we are. We're talking about millions of Africans. Where some great souls have come down here to help us. And, and we didn't even get a fair description of who they were, only of their current event deeds. The law of vibration and the law of duality are very essential in understanding the mental and the spiritual and the physical plane because it brings us to. The rationale of karma. Why so many bad things happen to so many good people. In understanding the law of cause and effect via the law of duality, we understand that thought is what sets up the karmic pattern. Remembering that thought is first image as an idea, 
than it is word as an idea, than it is action as an idea. Those are the component parts of cause and effect. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. That's a good preach. Get a congregation of devil. And he should have been explaining the positive aspect of that principle. Karma is not all bad. That karma is essential for getting to where you're going. That your thinking can develop and change your karmic pattern. That your imagination through the practice of visualization can change your karmic pattern. That meditation can change your karmic pattern. Cause and effect. The mental plane sets into motion that which will manifest on the physical plane. What we see before us, including our body, is the result of thought. The manifest universe. The physical form, color, sound, and the odors are the result Mother, of thought. Thing down. Each one of us is an idea in the great mind of God. Each one of us is a great idea in each one of our minds. Why it is important to think well of yourself. Very important. Especially since we discovered this melanin in our blood. Remembering that melanin is in our brain, we think with it. It is very powerful, very potent. It covers and coats all of the brain faculties. It flows up and down the spinal cord, the brain stem. We literally swim in melanin. We can't think outside of a melanin consciousness. I got a pamphlet I want to get to. I think it's right. It means black. Uh, what uh, Dr. Richard King found is uh, Locus corollius from the uh, Sanskrit word corollius, which he points out means black doorway. We're supposed to be getting to that. Uh, I want to try to do at least three of these principles in terms of the Uchis eye or the eye of Horus. We'll get to that. Uh, what I was supposed to do was talk about uh, the metaphysical interpretation of Popeye the Sailor Man. So uh, as soon as we finish the second, the third principle, we'll jump right on that. That takes right into the third eye. Uh, the key here, what we're finding out about vibration and about duality and cause and effect is to watch your thinking and to groom your thinking. Don't think nigger. Quit using. Quit referring to the rest of us as such. Quit seeing the worst of the diamond in the rough. See the diamond. Very important. You're going to be amazed at how much power your mind has right now. And as you develop, your mental power will develop. As you raise your energy level, the velocity of your own energy, so will the thought in your consciousness move faster to get done the things that you think out into the world. Isaiah's attributed as saying, uh, my thoughts shall go out, but they shall not come back to me void. He understood the power of his own mind. And we can understand that. We have very powerful minds. I walked away with me too hard. I had an experience at 15. 
came out of the queen of the temple, that was back, walked out and walked off and talked to And the idea that came to me is not that I can get inside this dog. Now, the reason I thought that was because there was an article in the paper earlier that month that Ezra Charles had hypnotized the dog. He had an ability to hypnotize. So it just occurred to me. So I turned around and looked at the dog and just fought it. I'm playing, you know, 15 years old, a knucklehead. And the dog stopped. And I said in my mind, later, the dog later, I said, roll over. And the dog rolled over. And I went walking away with him. And I forgot about the dog still laying there. <laughs> so I, I put my, my clothes hooked in here and I did like this. I'm like, the dog got I was just playing around, you know? I mean, just, you know. We need to understand from which we came because we're carrying something of value with us. Each one of you has spiritual power. You can't get it at heart. It ain't there. It ain't that Morehouse. It's within you. But you and you alone can release it. How can you do that? By your willingness to take the responsibility for divine power. That's all the Creator wants you to do. Your willingness to take responsibility for divine power. In your spiritual experience, you will get opportunities to do so. To do something wonderful or to F it up, you'll have both opportunities. But in that process, what you're doing is discovering yourself. Understand that factor. That's the major factor. I don't know how you're Individual karmic patterns are, some are, are, are unfolding up to a point, and then their higher spirit stops them and holds them fast for a while. If, if you're grown to a certain point, what is called the spiritual feeling, you're not getting any further. But then you have to reevaluate your moral fiber, first of all, and your intent. Every master is given an opportunity to do right or to do wrong with his power. This is an example given of Jesus being tempted by Satan on the mountain. Every one of us will be tempted by the inner spirit to take what you have and do something stupid with it. But understanding that, that you, are, you are in the process of inheriting your spiritual element. Understanding the law of attraction is impersonal. The greatest love is impersonal love. When it comes into your nature, then it personalizes itself within you. But it is still impersonal love. What is missing in our world, in our community, on this planet, is impersonal love. We can't even deal with the difference. You know, uh, most preachers fall into the same rhetoric. You know, we're, we're all the same. We're all God's children. But that's fine. <laughs> so what? You know, what we keep seeing in the creation, what we keep discovering in terms of what science and art is, it keeps saying the beauty of the Creator is the potential to vary, to differentiate. The uniqueness of each one of you is that though we look alike, we are uniquely different from each of ourselves. Even people who have the same name do not perform, think the same way. Even those born on the same day, the same year, even at almost the same time, twins, can be almost antithetical in personality. That's how unique we are. So there's something you are becoming that I can't become. There's something she's becoming that he can't become. And he's becoming that this brother can't become. A talent and a power he has that that brother doesn't have. Vice versa. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for your treasure. And it's within you. The price you must pay to pay attention to yourself. Very, very, very important. 
Okay, let's jump at this idea here. Popeye the Sailor Man, the comic strip, is very interesting. First of all, our children are educated by comic strips. They're educated by cartoons, by cartoon characters. They find a love more for animals first before they find love for human beings. That's the way the basic elementary system of educating Western children is structured. You know, the, the, the most popular animal on this planet is a mouse. <laughs> and most women are scared to death of rats. It's really interesting. Little old Mickey. The problem with cartoons, the problem with comic books, is the extraordinary level of violence that it produces and projects that into my children's consciousness. So they grow up at two years old, and I've seen this. Whack! You get their little buddy on the head, you know, and laugh, you know. I mean, like he was supposed to fall down and get up, and it was all right, you know. If they have to be a little bit bigger than this buddy, he goes lightning to it with all fours. But they use the cartoon media not to educate and cultivate and to develop, but to entertain. So one of the real problems with Western culture is it's an entertainment culture, it's not educational culture. This character, Papa, I'm going to try to draw Papa, has been around and with us so long. What is interesting here? Uh, I'm going to try to do a, a, an artistic job here. I'll, I'll resign myself to something ridiculous. about this cartoon, I'll draw this one because it doesn't come. When he comes on, he comes on in the center of a white stock that's spinning. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. That is not human geometry. That's spiritual geometry. I had big experience myself. Without Popeye's face, a spinning white star in Kriya Yoga, or what the aphorism of Patanjali tells us is that you're looking for a five-pointed star in your third eye that will spin, expand, and you have to go through it in your higher consciousness. The other factor is that he is a hero. Papa has these powerful forearms, exaggerated for his own puny body. But he who is forewarned is forearmed. He is forever saving this woman. He's putting it, the last one I saw, he had a 
like goldfish. And uh, you get lots of goldfish, and then she got guilty about keeping the goldfish in a small bowl uh, because the goldfish looked like it was unhappy. So she takes the goldfish and throws it back into the ocean. And then she sits down and weeps because the goldfish is gone. So Popeye jumps in the ocean to save his beloved goldfish. And he called hell down there. <laughs> and he gets, finds the goldfish and tricks him and runs all over the water. Gets the goldfish, brings it back up, puts it back in the bowl. And she's thanking and hugging and kissing him and says, Oh, he's so sad. And he throws throws the goldfish back into it. So, so he does anything for his beloved olive oil. Then you think of a particular vegetable that is an olive and what color that olive is. Black olive. <laughs> this is the one full of melon. <laughs> Dr. Ali gave a description in his book, The Land Circle 7. That I can point was that of a dark olive. But in terms of the oil factor, of course, that would put us right into it. So the metaphysics are there. But what is most interesting about this character is that one of his eyes is always closed. One. Always closed. Okay, that takes us right into Uche, the old Moorish word for spiritual eye, what is called sound eye. John, no, oh, excuse me, Matthew, chapter, uh, I can give you this misquoted again. Okay, it's in Matthew and Luke. That's something interesting because there's a direct mistranslation there in this verse with my glasses. And uh, the American Revised Standard Translation of 1895, the verse reads, thinking of, it reminds me of the absent minded professor up there. Uh, Yeah. 
Anybody found this yet? Genesis chapter 32. Uh, just start, start at the first, the very first of the chapter. I don't think that's a significant uh, word. Like a story, it's not quite as long and it's just sound to me. What's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? I think it's just I think that Mike was just trying to pick them up, got the static. Oh, okay. okay. Numerology and name is very much pronounced. It's the minister that I've heard talk about the changing of Jacob's name to Israel simply said that he had prevailed. But that is not what Israel means. It, it, it tells you right there clearly the definition of these three words. I see Ra. Male and female. God. Power with God is the power of God. To illustrate the changing of name, why it occurs on various auspicious occasions. Such as Abram and Abraham. So we, we, we don't want to get right into that because we're dealing with this particular concept of the penal gland. Go on now, my brother. Yeah. 
He lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, Who are those with thee? And he said, The children which God has graciously given as servants. Okay, this is when he's meeting he saw David meeting his brother. That's my finding is where he makes this thing. Okay. Here, this is verse 10, chapter 33, verse 10. And uh, I'm going to read verse 9. And I was like, He saw said, I have enough, my brother, keep that thou hast unto thyself. And Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my presence at my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face, and though I had seen the face of God. Said it twice. He said it once. He was wrestling with the angel of the Lord. It turned out that he came to the realization that he had seen the face of God. Then he rediscovered that. That the face that he saw the angel, the face of his own brother. Having spiritual insight. But essentially, what we're talking about is this particular faculty in our brain that gives you the possibility of seeing in the spirit of seeing in the spirit but beyond time the important thing about adhering to the idea of clairvoyance or clear vision is that you're talking dimensionally the clear
clairvoyance can see in the past and the present. He or and she can also see into the future. Long distances into the future. Very important faculty. That is, now I, I don't agree with Dr. King. He, he said uh, that 85% uh, of most black folks' spiritual faculty is not calcified. I don't agree with that. I think part of the problem of our human growth and development is the problem of calcification. We're talking about a very sensitive gland that responds to vibration, it responds to harmonious and inharmonious sound, argument, anger, fear, hatred, resentment, stinginess, pettiness, all of that calcifies the spiritual nature within ourselves. That is sits up in the state that we're trying to get away from. In the spiritualization of your mind, you are also regenerating your brain. I think I mentioned this before, the brain is in your head, but the mind is from the crown of your head all the way to the soles of your feet. You think from your head to your feet and with your feet and your head because you live in a mind. It is not invisible. We just can't see it. It is referred to as Allah from the throat as the field of energy. The field of energy. We live in a field of energy within us and without. We literally live in the mind of God. That is a power field. This is approximately where the penile gland is. In the, the ventricle system. The point of consciously bringing the attention here allows you to send your energy electrically to that point. If you pay attention, you'll feel the vibratory energy right between the eyebrows, which is what it's called in yoga or I was going to say especially Kriya yoga, but that is the only field. It's called the spiritual sky. Uh, those of you who have the Ebalian might have such an experience with that's a very powerful little book. One of the things you're looking for in meditation is for the spiritual sky to open up. If you don't open it, it opens when you are vibrating at this near spiritual divine rhythmic pattern. Your human rhythm slows down. And your divine rhythm begins when you're at a state of what's called perfect rest. Something happens. Something happens. Like it's throwing out the body, I know. Something happens. It's a point of balance. What you get most essentially every day of meditation is you get confidence in yourself. You get tuned into your inner voice, your inner God, the Lord within you, that tells you what to do if you will only ask. Okay. Pay attention. A lot of times we talk about have to pay attention my first time. Nevertheless, that's your insight. That's your inner voice telling you. What is interesting, when it's truly your spirit, it only says it once. A very excellent example of that is Sister in uh, Cleveland, who was a welfare recipient and needed a heart transplant. A black woman in Jamaica read this in the Jamaican paper. Her spirit said it once. She said, Sorry, we'll come back to it. She got on the phone right away. She called and told us she was paid $125,000 herself. She was like, This is blessed forever. She's following the divine. And he knew her name. 
I'm just illusion. Okay, so I'm just an ordinary, you know, bad medicine, folks. <laughs> bad, bad medicine. That ain't gonna heal nothing. The Aquarian gospel of Jesus the Christ. That's where Noble Jaw Lee got most of his pamphlet for his Koran verse and seven. But he doesn't say he wrote that, he said he prepared it. So legitimate input. There's some very interesting information in there. Uh any questions about the third eye? Yes, sir. where we may have been headed. Right, that, that's what uh, Dr. King is talking about in this book here. Can't speak or not cover very well. The African origins of biological psychiatrists. I have a little pamphlet that unfortunately went out of print. I will uh, melanin, the golden key. I think you should read before you read this. This isn't is, is hard reading. Uh, but, but it puts you right into an area of study. Uh, unless you've been studying all along, I know there are a lot of ASCAP students here. Uh, all along, they don't make a great deal of sense. It's an excellent book. Uh, I heard a uh, doctor, um, a medical doctor, doing the writing, criticized Dr. King to talk about all the black doctors. Yeah, I, I wonder if his brother's got a problem with his complexion. He's very light skinned. I can't think of brother's name. Yes, like yeah, yeah. Understand something. The white skin African also has melanin. The, the concept about light complexion is the complexion nearest to that of gold. There is a statement in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, I thank thee, Father, for thy hidden skin. Your spirit body can get a gold complexion uh, under the one that you have. So don't, don't get embarrassed about not being completely dark. Okay. Even those who are jet black but, but don't have all of what that spiritually represents. Don't get caught up in pride, knowledge, know something. Yes, sir. You said that was numerical. Yeah, uh, I, I don't want to get that. 164 and so forth, but well, I, I, I can't explain it. But as you all know, this is a pot. Yeah, this is part of the third eye. That's pot. That's the, the Greeks claim white boys and all the Greeks. Yeah, I'm trying to read it really from the Bible to say, uh, to say that something that um, we must not, our children, we must not eat of something. Less. Oh, the, the, the sin of, of, of the, of the shank of the, uh, of the uh, animal. Yeah. yeah well that, that's ritualism. I read both if most European Jews know what it means. It's reference to the holding on the thigh, the quick of that particular static nerve that runs to the foot all the way up to the brain and attaches to the penal part. For the spiritual beauty, you know, on both sides.
chanting a mantra. They can only they throw chakra. They can't hit Visually, the reason why they're called Mohawks. Okay. I want you to add any information on the function of the hormone melatonin and serotonin. Yes, in fact, I want to do that. I don't want to crowd everything. In fact, I'll make it my to talk about melatonin and serotonin next week. Uh, it fits in with the penal gland. What I want to point out though, because there are higher chemistry in your astral body that you have access to in meditation. What you're trying to do in meditation is get the mouth of God open. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's your medulla Allah. That will open. You will hear it click. You will see the top open on your own medulla oblongata, and this substance will flow out and down your vertebrae. That's it. That's what Moses is telling. Telling us it's wonderful. And then I'm reminded by saying my father, yes, my brother was telling us it's not God. No. Okay. So we want something. You're filled up. Your cup really can run over. Uh, with melanin, you get melanin back. I was standing in the mirror and after meditating one afternoon, it's here. I'm 967. I read one book, but I read everything. I think it's like the face. I look at her. Like something going down on me. Ooh. <laughs> that black over here. <laughs> Back in the body, it is a spiritual substance that you get back. You get these back and over. Meditation is very important for us. Very important for the race. So my interest is with us first. Then we get with them. Meditate is a problem. You get no more than like one of the glasses. If I need this pill, what else you got? About 40 pounds of sugar in a quick blood. All of it. I heard one show that it's like 50 years ago to say the reading is 125 pounds of sugar, not about the 40 pounds of sugar per person. Of sugar, that's a small child. And it takes all of your nutrients out of your body. Your vitamin C, particularly, if you run trans, that's why your children can't get this. They have sugar sensitivity. They don't have to. You run trans. Keep their attention on such so, matter less sudden so, matter hypnotized and almost like hunger. If it's on this all day, they don't you know, need to help them detox. Sugar and fast food, I think, is a pre laid diet for receptivity to drugs. This drug stuff started about the same time that McDonald's got busy distributing all this garbage. Look up it everywhere you go in America. They got fast food store and pile on top of fast food stores in our neighborhood. They're all over it. It comes to checkers. Somebody I ain't never heard of <laughs> You know, they get some of this money. You know, six, seven million dollars a week. They go to my books here. Not this man, all this stuff. I think one brother was telling me. Oh, they have been over. All the money checkers. So it, that's okay. The problem is, it's bad food. Okay. That's the problem. If you got no choice, there's a spiritual princess out of the Egyptian parable. He who eats no meat shall have great power. That doesn't mean because one doesn't eat, it doesn't get great power. That was given to the condition in the nation. Refrain from eating for a period of time. And um, what he granted. But what happens is that you build a body that's more receptive. That dense uh, organ, you got damaged faculties in your brain. Look how it is, it's not going to work. Ah, a damaged gland or a damaged. You got spiritual faculties all over your body. 
really is a temple. It really is. You got some of this. this I mean, man, did it, man. These books. Yeah, well, we are hooked up. You know, we are hooked up. But you got to get up there to appreciate what you really are. You visualize what you want. And you start doing that immediately. Okay? Refute the poverty. Refute or keep those words out of your mind. Throw those away. Don't even feel that dumb stuff. Okay. This is the richest country in the life is where we are. So we're supposed to own some of it. If you have anything you so desire, not anything you want. Anything you so desire. You understand what I'm saying? You must so the desire for the things that you want, for what you want to accomplish. That's, that's the law of mind. Whatever the mind conceives and believes, the mind can achieve. Remember that conception is birth. The real principle is whatever the mind conceives, the mind must believe, and the mind must achieve. That's anything. If you keep seeing yourself in a car accident, lo and behold, you shall have one. Mm. If you keep seeing yourself without money, without being able to pay the see yourself paying the bills, see yourself counting the money, see yourself with your pocket looking like football. <laughs> <laughs> Keep saying it and keep saying it. You gotta believe. You're trying to convince your subconscious. That, that, that's your, your work area. That, that, or your worst enemy. But it's already conditioned to, to, to keep us in, in this peculiar state that it keeps seeing all these empty houses and empty lots and garbage cans everywhere. You know, the subconscious is watching all this. The way you pull it. I wonder if the brother would get 50,000 running out there on the whiteboard. You know, he's down looking at the garbage. Instead of turning around and getting his vision and changing it. Because you know, he's been changing. It looks like they're doing down here in this area. It looks very good down there. But that, that's the master at work. You know, so when the brother gets to this point where he knows what like the uh, uh, Barry White got up in front of the television uh, camera and said, I'm at this point recognizing my Godhood and my God consciousness. You know, this big, heavy, powerful boy. Brother knows who he is. That's important. To know and to acknowledge your Godhood. That's important. Very important. It changes your energy. You can, at a certain point, just stay there. We're going, to, oh, oh, I forgot about my bad. It is what I want to get because we're going to do that on the day. I'm glad. <laughs> what is my what is bad's favorite thing? Mm. I remember. I am, I am, I am, I am. Very important. Very important. We're going to work with this. Powerful affirmation. Very powerful. Any of the tools about it. The thing okay, that, that, that will give us time to, to meditate. Okay, no chairs available. Great, I don't want to see you folks. I need a chair. We got another one back over here. First time for you to buy a chair and bring it up here and I just put it in. That will chair down there is not good for you. Or I'll be gone. Last week, we worked with the flower. And I want to keep that because it's very important. We're working on the heart chakra. No. 
no higher state in the English language than I am. But the problem is, or the solution, not to be used. I am sick, I am poor, I am broke, I am hungry, I am. So add the negative to I am. The place and attaching it to your subconscious when you say I am and broke, I am not. Just oxygenize the brain. This one over this. Now, if you spend all of your mouth, put some oxygen into your system. I am a bad I Now, take your thumb and 
place your thumbs over your earlobe flap and close your ears. Place your fingers on your forehead and your head. I want you to hear the sound you're making. Use the same temperament we just finished. Now breathe in. Close your ears and breathe in. I am that I am that I am that I am. Same energy, the same keynote. With that, you change your consciousness. You raise your energy. You got a headache, you finish this, you ain't got no more headache. Five minutes. That's what you do if you did one hour. Very powerful. You're moving electricity in your own work. Okay, let's take it to the third phase this time. You listen carefully after finishing one set of you will hear the energy around your head ringing. That's the pranic energy that's coming from your head and your vibratorial power center in your throat. You're creating reach and generating the energy yourself. Let's do one more. I am that 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 I am before you use that one in a very slow context, use the word concept, relax in this fashion. You really want to relax. Sit down and lay down either way, doesn't matter. What you're doing when you stretch this word out. You see yourself stretching out. You see your all oh, your legs getting longer, your arms getting longer, or your body getting wider. You take the mental picture and stretch it out with that word. Your whole body will start to remind you. Be Break the flower, the rose, the red rose, right to your heart center, right in the center of your chest. Get a clear picture of this beautiful red rose. Start to remember how a rose smells. See the rose and smell the rose. Think about love. This is the natural symbol for divine love. A rose feels, or rather, love feels, a real rose smell. Love the <coughs> you see the rose in the center of your heart chakra. 
I want to make sure there's plenty of time for questions because the topics are obviously uh, very controversial, very interesting, I think, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions, lots of disagreement. So uh, I want to make sure there's plenty of time. So someone, Joe, will give me the time out if I go too long, and I really want to give you time to ask questions, and I'll hang out here as well. I'll stay afterwards, and you can you can ask the questions. All right, so. <clears throat> I will be reading at least parts of this paper. The problem is if I don't read, then I'm not that disciplined, then I will digress too much. And there, uh, there is a handout, so I hope that will be helpful. I, I start by referring to a book that I wrote uh, with Ben Mitchell Yellen, Near Death Experiences, Understanding Visions of the Afterlife. And that's more detailed in terms of some of the arguments that I'll just skip over in this talk, but I'll I'll tell you when I get to a place where you might want to look at that book. Um, then I have a new book coming out in June of this year that you might be interested in. And then there is a um, YouTube uh, video of a lecture I gave on near-death experiences at UC Riverside, but it's a different lecture. You might have fun with it. Okay. Near-death experiences. Well, maybe I can choose Near-death experiences, NDE take place in near-death contexts, situations in which an individual's life is in jeopardy. I, I've always thought maybe it should be situations in which the individual reasonably believes that their life is in jeopardy. But in any case, it's usually uh, put this way, that the individual's life is in jeopardy. The Dutch cardiologist and researcher on NDEs, Tim Van Lommel, describes 
NDEs as involving, quote, a range of impressions during a special state of consciousness, including a number of special elements, such as an out-of-body experience, pleasant feeling, seeing a tunnel, a light, deceased relatives, or a life review, or a conscious return to the body. So these are featured characteristic of near-death experiences. I will stipulate that an NDE takes place in a near-death context and has a sufficient number of the characteristics identified by Van Hommel. Others, including Bruce Grayson, who's an MD at the University of Virginia, have studied and identified these features of NDEs. He has produced what is called an NDE scale, which measures the degree to which an NDE possesses these elements. Three, uh, sorry, four salient aspects are an out-of-body experience, OBE, i.e. an experience of floating above one's body and seeing it and its surroundings from above. So that's the way it appears to me. Um, a life review, where your life kind of comes before you, it's sometimes presented narratively or sequentially and sometimes kind of all at once. And an experience of traveling toward a light in a dark tunnel or perhaps crossing a river or otherwise proceeding toward a different realm. Typically, one is guided in this voyage toward a different realm by deceased loved ones or loving parental or re religious figures. Various theorists have identified a range of signature features of NDEs, and they have pointed out that it is not necessary for a genuine NDE to have them all. Okay, NDEs are better thought of as a syndrome or what philosophers following Ludwig Wittgenstein call a family resemblance notion. That is, an NDE must contain some subset of the relevant features, but it's impossible to specify the required number of features in advance. Just as members of an extended family have physical features in common, but no individual has all of them, presumably, or might not have all of them. So family resemblance uh, notion. Most NDEs are described as very positive experiences, and those who have had NDEs have changed their behavior significantly. Tim Van Lombo has studied people who've had NDEs in the context of cardiac arrest, and he has observed that the NDEs have had notable transformational effects. These individuals have less death anxiety and are more spiritual, by and large, not everyone. They are more pro-social, appreciating relationships more, and spending more time with family, friends, and relatives. They are also more compassionate and attuned to morality and justice. The transformations are often profound. And so in his work, uh, Tim Van Lommel, the cardiologist from uh, the Netherlands, goes through in detail the data on these transformations. NDEs are amazing, and not just because of their capacity to transform, some near-death experience reports can be corroborated independently and some cannot. Many of the latter sort, the ones that can't be independently corroborated, describe communication with deceased relatives and confrontation with a heavenly or otherworldly realm, an environment hospitable to immortality. Consider, for example, the neurosurgeon Avon Alexander's NDE. Has, has anyone read his book? Uh, okay, good in which he found himself in a, quote, beautiful, incredible dream world, except it wasn't a dream, end quote. He describes himself flying along with, quote, a beautiful girl with high cheekbones and deep blue eyes, end, end quote. Sometime after his NDE, when shown a photo of her, this was, uh, well, Alexander recognized this girl as his deceased sister, whom he had never met. He writes, quote, we were riding along together on an intricately patterned surface, alive with indescribable and vivid colors, the wing of a butterfly. In fact, millions of butterflies were all around us, vast fluttering waves of them, dipping down into the greenery and coming back up around us again. Without using any words, she spoke to me. The message had three parts. You are loved and cherished dearly forever. You have nothing to fear. There is nothing you can do wrong. Alexander holds that this rich set of experiences occurred while he was in a coma and his brain was not capable of having experiences. He was a neurosurgeon, or he is a neurosurgeon. So. 
But while I, quote, but while I was in a coma, my brain hadn't been working improperly. It hadn't been working at all. The part of my brain that years of medical school had taught me was responsible for creating the world I lived and moved around in and for taking the raw data that came in through my senses and fashioning it into a meaningful universe. That part of my brain was down and out. And yet, despite all of this, I had been alive and aware, truly aware, in a universe characterized above all by love, um, consciousness, and reality. There was, for me, simply no arguing this fact. I know it so completely that I ached. I'm sorry, I knew it so completely that I ached. What I had experienced was more real than the house I sat in, more real than the logs burning in the fireplace. And he calls it ultra real, his experience. So Avon Alexander's Proof of Heaven, a neurosurgeon's journey into the afterlife, in which he discusses his NDE, has sold millions of copies. And it has influenced many people around the world. Um, he also has a sequel called Map of Heaven. Alexander himself reports many transformative effects. Although he had grown up in a religious family prior to his NDE, he had been skeptical about religion. But after his NDE, he became a believer in religion and the afterlife, although, of course, the content of his NDE was not exactly theologically orthodox, not flying on a, a wing of a butterfly. Um, he repeatedly describes his NDE as real, and there is even a chapter of Proof of Heaven called the Ultra Real. Now, uh, let's talk about another uh, book in the popular uh, culture. Uh, Colton Burpo's NDE is described in the book, co-written by his father, Todd Burpo, Heaven is for Real. This book has sold, also sold millions of copies, and it was made into a motion picture that was widely distributed and viewed by millions. Okay. Colton became ill a few months shy of his fourth birthday. He was diagnosed with a burst appendix and underwent two surgeries. After he recovered, apparently miraculously, Colton began recollecting and reporting experiences he had while undergoing the first surgery and under anesthesia. He had visited heaven and personally met Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit. He had met various deceased relatives, one of whom was a sister who had never been born due to a miscarriage. He saw angels and John the Baptist, and he even saw his parents in the hospital at the time of his surgery, his father and mother in different rooms praying. Okay, so these are extraordinary reports, it's amazing experiences, and there are many, many more, of course. Uh, I do want to, I, and I, for one, take these very seriously. I respect them as sincere, by and large, very sincere and interesting. And there are patterns throughout Yo. history and across cultures and within the same culture, patterns of similarities in these.